Welcome to Tap Revolution 2013. We've got a great DVD together for you this year. You've even got me back in it. I couldn't be in it last year because I was doing final count. I'm fishing a lot, so is Alan Blair, and I hope we can entertain you and maybe give you a few tips. But the real star of the DVD, of course, is the tackle. It's been a blinding year for Nash and real truly innovative blockbusters on there. So sit back and enjoy Tackle Revolution 2013. My fishing, obviously, I'm quite often fish for the larger fish and fish mature, weedy waters, gravel pits normally. So, quite often they're quite sizeable waters, so I need a rod that can cast. And because of the nature of them waters, weed and everything else, I need to be using quite a strong line. That quite often the diameter of the line I'm using is a 0.40, so I need to be able to cast that a fair distance as well. So. You know, I'll need a rod that's over three pound test curve, up to about three and a half test curve, with not too many eyes on and you know, like decent size eyes because of the thick line I'm using, so that's what I'm sort of looking for in a rod anyway. Rods I'm using today are the um, new Nash NRXDs, uh, the 12 foot three and a half version I've got there, so that seems to suit my purpose at the moment. The action I'm looking for is tip action, like it needs to be a little bit forgiving in the tip but as it progresses down the blank it needs to you know, start beefing up when you get into the butt section. So I mean the reason why I like that is obviously you need to feel the lead down so you need the tips to be fairly responsive and obviously the power in the butt. Sometimes you get a big fish that's weeded, you need to be able to move that weed you know, help you break the weed strands and that. The way I tend to play a fish through weed, I need that tip to be in touch with the fish. I don't want it to be too brutal, but I need it to be quite powerful. So sometimes when a fish starts moving its head when it hasn't moved for a while, I want to feel it move that head and that's my chance to try and tease him out of the weed. So that's really what I'm looking for, the action of a rod. water I've been fishing most of the winter has been sander so it's sort of a case of getting bites more than hunting some specific big fish out. The lake's dominated with maggot fishing and PVA bags. I could use a bait boat but from what I've seen over the years I know it's bait boats tend to scare the fish off so you need to be able to cast a decent sized bag of maggots in amongst fish and some of the casts on here are sort of 80 to 90 yards. I need a rod that's capable of handling three ounces of lead and a few ounces of maggots. So you sort of pass in weights of sort of five to six ounces, I'm trying to get 90 yards with them. So. With any rod, it's all about balancing your tackle. I mean, they're a powerful rod, three and a half pound test curve, so you're not sort of going to be using size 12 and 14 hooks with them. You know, you have to sort of ga gauge your hook size up and all your presentation so everything's balanced, you know.
we are today on a lake, club lake in deepest Essex. It's about three acres, kind of water, a lot of you fish. And that's the reason we're here, really. I have a lot of um, people write to me, try and get their head around how they approach a new water. And yeah, it is difficult. It's not going to be any less easy for us today, probably, because we don't know this water. We've had a good look around. Um, all really I can do is use our experience, you know, and uh, think about it and plus what you read I guess you know, normally I'd love a westerly and fish in the teeth of it and I was thinking oh this is where I want to be where we're standing now but when we went down the other end it was distinctly warmer down totally there. different weren't it yeah. you know you can stand there it felt right and we saw a carp so you'd immediately think that's the place to go but then I checked the weather always important to check the weather um, and we know if they're going to get it right it's going to get distinctly warmer and uh, a lot warmer in fact it's probably about 12 degrees now it's going to go up to 20 so I'm kind of thinking I still want to be on this uh, westerly wind um, don't know what Adam thinks what do you think I'm mate? probably going to go a little bit further up Kev and you know I'm still going to be in the wind but I quite like this dam wall you know it looks like a dam anyway and I, I presume it's probably a deeper end and I'm going to look at the margins up there I think well I do agree yeah, that's where we saw that carp in yeah. that quieter water so you're down there we're both covering an area yeah. aren't we? anyway From you're the one who needs to catch I just well, need to experiment well, I always <laughs> want to catch yeah I'm here to catch and what's your plan then my plan as usual is I'm the guinea pig I've done a winter <laughs> testing gear you know, sleeping bags and bed chairs um and I have to say, I'm getting so into uh, the zig thing, absolutely fascinated by uh, that whole form of fishing. I think we're on the eve of a revolution, if you like, you know, and so much exciting stuff to learn. And I fancy the zigs up in the water, certainly in the daylight. Either by this evening, I'll be craving wanting to catch one because then it's empty the lake, or I'm also very interested in zig fishing at night, so I may stick it out and try and prove a point. If I get one in this session, I'll be happy. Should we go get some gear? Yeah, let's go and get some let's gear. Let's go and get some gear. Tackle set up and the zig rods are out. We've been fishing a couple of hours actually. I haven't had anything. I'm a little bit worried about the wind, uh, how cold it is, but I'm going to think about that as I'm giving you a few of my thoughts on zig rigs for those of you who are not sure it's a method of uh, suspending a bait off the bottom but below the surface and that in its own is unusual or is a relatively new concept you know, yes in the 80s we messed around with um, pieces of a uh, floater cake anchored off the bottom actual bait you know, uh, something we would have made up you know, I'm sure a lot of you caught uh, fish on pop-ups popped well off the bottom. But then things kind of changed and people started using foam. And then the foam got smaller until it's tiny little bits of foam. Because they found that was most effective. And that's when I really started thinking what's going on here. And the clue to me, rightly or wrongly, was the fact that anglers had to use tiny pieces of foam on size 10 hooks. It was kind of saying to me at that size the carp couldn't distinguish. You know, whether it was an insect or an artificial bit of food or foam with a hook in it. And if when you start thinking insects, actually hunting for carp in an area of the lake had never really been fished for before, and uh, trying to mimic creatures that they've naturally eaten and never been caught on before, that's why I start to get really excited. A couple of years now I've been messing around with loads of different fly patterns, you know, bugs and all that, trying to narrow down ones that are more effective. We went off in two directions, one kind of based on colour, so we launched a range of tractor beetles uh, where the bottoms are black or white, so you know, at night they're you know, looking up, they see the black, and in daytime perhaps they'd be attracted to the white, uh, but then we coloured the tops different colours. Anyway, eventually I identified three good working colour combinations. And the other way we've gone, which is equally, if not more exciting to me, is um, the more natural route, trying to um, mimic uh, natural insects that would be in those mid-water areas. So we brought out several patterns uh, of insects to mimic those. That's the first phase, but you know, what of the future? We're also looking at 
night zigging, which again, fascinating subject, luminous patterns that we're definitely uh, having some success on them. It's very encouraging uh, presenting flies that actually do glow in the dark. And then there's, I think the term luminescence, picking materials which reflect the light in various colours. Like for example, a peacock's feather, you know, the way the light hit it, it changes colour. That's another route we're looking at as well. So lots of exciting stuff that we've worked at and uh, hopefully one day we'll be bringing out some new patterns for you to enjoy success on. I've also been experimenting with liquid attractors. Yeah, the Zigbugs, well proven to work without attractors, but on their day, and certainly there is days where you know, boosting with an attractor does work. But I found something also very interesting, a great little fishing edge. You know, I've had those occurrences, a quick bleep, a double bleep. Don't know whether it's just something uh, happening out there, something's hit the line, or whether something's actually had a go at the bug. Well, last winter I was flavoring my zig bugs with zig juice, as I call our prototype attractors, and I had a double bleep. And I looked out, and it was quite a windy day, and the surface flattened straight away. So the carpet attacked the zig bug, knocked some of the uh, tractor out of it, and the oil floated to the top, let me know that I had a missed to take. That brought the zig in and I dropped it three inches. Within half an hour, I had one on the bank. My amazing riser pellet, primary design for floater fishing, can be a fantastic boom when you're zig rig fishing. You have know, had great success uh, drifting out the riser pellet, with the bits of riser pellet falling through the water, bring the carp up looking, but they just won't go to the surface. You put a zig at the foot down and you nail them. Conversely, I thought the opposite logic. I've started messing around with ground baits. The logic of instead of, as with the riser pellet, the pellet drifting down, we make a ground bait that you ball up, throw it out, and it starts breaking down, and pieces of riser pellet float up. That way, it's attracting the carp to follow the riser pellet up you know, into the areas where your zig is, or start hunting more in mid water. If you want to master zig fishing, I think what I'm going to say next is really important and that is that you have to commit yourself fully and it's important you commit yourself fully with all rods and I'll explain why. It's the key thing in zig fishing is the depth, the zone that they're swimming at. Six inches either way and it's quite likely you won't get a bite. But get in that zone that might only be six inch wide area of water and you could have it off. You've got to commit all three rods to it, or four, however many you use. And how I do it is, I'll set one at X depth, you know, that's like my benchmark depth. So let's say it's 12 foot of water, I'll set it at seven foot on this day. And then I'll put one at six foot six, and one at seven foot six. If I'm in the action for a while, and I'm convinced there's fish around, I'll move the seven foot six one up to eight, and the six foot six down to six, just basically seeking out that zone until I find it. But anyway, I'll end on just a few words about the two you know, rigs that most people use. The fixed zig rig firstly. A couple of things I've learned there is that sometimes you know, I've noticed getting mistakes and that, and I watch fish come up to it. They look like they're trying to suck it in but can't. You know, I was talking to Jack Brown about this and he'd spotted fish from a tree doing exactly the same, just missing his rigs. And he's showing me a nifty little rig. He's tied a bit of pole elastic into his rig down by the lead. Just so when the fish come down, it's just that little bit of movement to make sure they can suck it in easily. And Adam Blair's come up with a cracker. It's about four inches of a tungsten tube with a towel rub on the end. You just put that on your swivel at the, uh, you know, the other end of the zig rig link. And that lays on the bottom. So when the carp comes down, it sucks in the bug and the boom just lifts up, just gives it that bit of movement. It really does work, so I'd recommend that. With the adjustable Z-Rig, as I said, I think a lot of people are frightened that the float spooks the carp. And certainly I believe it would if you had it too near the bug. Um, we've attacked that both ways. We've brought out our own Z-Rig float, a transparent job, so it doesn't show up in the water. But also I try and get the float as far away from the uh, zig bug as I can. To say, for example, you expect to fish from six foot up to say nine foot, you know, moving it around to try and find the zone. I'll, I'll tie the float in at 
six foot. So you know, when I pulled it right there and the float is right on the bottom, so I've got to say like five foot of link between the float and the bug, maximum distance away. Yeah, that's how I do it anyway, and it seems to work for me. So there you are, my thoughts on Zigwigs. Guess I better go and catch one now. It's all right talking about it, isn't it? It's one thing doing that, it's another thing catching them. And on that note, um, I said it's a new water, we don't know anything about it. You know, so just like anyone goes to a new water, you've got to try and work it out. This morning we arrived, strong westerly into this corner, but this wind has got a real bitter bite to it. If I was a carp, I want the sun on my back in spring. You know, I think sun is so important to carp where they live in a lake, especially in spring. So I'm going to move. Been a couple of hours. I haven't caught anything on the zigs in this swim, so I'm going to try another swim. I mentioned in my intro I was experimenting with ground baits with zig fishing and this is it. I'm really getting excited about this stuff, it's wicked. Been on it two, three months, driving Gary Bays at Nash Bait mad to try and get it right because it is a tricky one but it's really getting there now. I call it my gyro bug mix, you know, one because there's all sorts of bugs and everything in it and it's mad. You know, when you see it rising up in the surface, some of the bugs and even the bits of riser pellet kind of spin, you know, like a, a beetle. It's got all that moving in there. I'm sure it's going to be a massive catcher for a lot of people. It's certainly, I think I've had three fish on it now, you know, on the experimental ones. So it's early days yet, but I think it's going to be a winner. Um, also, out of it's come another product, what we call the ball maker, because I wanted to get tight balls out at range. And so we've come up with this little natty uh, gadget. All you do is fill up your the big section with your ground bait. So you know when I say ground bait, it'd be great for pleasure anglers as well. Give it a good compression, press the bottom button, and out comes a perfect compressed ball that you can put out at range with a catapult. That's awesome, isn't it? I love it. So I move around the other side, um, I've been fishing two hours. I tend to, whenever I move into a new swim, try and disturb it as minimally, you know, not put any bait out, markers or anything, just try it at first, because there might be fish there you could spook. Anyway, nothing's happened yet, so now's the time to try my secret weapon of the gyro bug mix. And what I'm going to do is catapult three or four in the line in front of me rods and concentrate in one area, because this is a no-lose bait, this, you know. It hits the water as it goes down, there's loads of little bits falling and then when it sits on the bottom it starts breaking up and there's all bits floating, you know, bits of riser pellets spinning in the water like gyrating beetles and then there's a residue left on the bottom. So you've got a chance of getting them with the bottom uh, bait rigs as well. And that's what I'll probably do tonight. I'll start feeding this in regularly and then put a, a bottom rig out there as well. So I'm covering both options, mid water and on the bottom. Wicked. Well, me and Kevin just sitting talking about how sunburnt we are and how enjoyable the day's been. And uh, so I thought, yeah, I'll chuck three jigs out just while I'm setting up my bottom bait rods. And uh, away she's gone. On a little bug, on one of the louse. Um, I'm fishing, I, I wouldn't say, I'd say I'm probably less than a foot under the surface. I'm literally under the surface. There you have it folks, cracking little mirror on one of the natural zig bugs, just fished under the surface. For the last half hour, half hour, 45 minutes, I've been throwing in balls of the riser ground bait and the result is this. 
and I don't think this is going to be the last one. See that? That's why this fish gets so big. It's absolutely heaving with naturals. Get on the bugs. It's a really dark night, no moon. I was going to wind two in and put them on bottom baits, but as Alan has had one on a zig, I've got to just stick at it. I can't let him be the only one to get a, a carp out of here on a zig. So I've just wound one in and I'm going to try one of my prototype blow bugs. So if Winston the famous cameraman would turn the light out, you might be able to see it glowing in the dark. Do -do 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 there you go people, look at that, isn't that awesome? A glow in the dark zig bug. There's two ways you can charge them up. You can charge them up with a torch, a UV light, but I'll give you a little tip. The flash on your camera really zaps them, makes them bright. So let's chuck it out and see what happens. Well, I've got a fish on here which is really slow. It kind of starts shaking when you get one that's really slow and plodding. It's often a really good fish. I'm jammed up now. We yes, yeah, it might be a walk back job you can. Go on, that's it. Okay. Yeah. What a mess. I need a floating mono here, not the XT, it's too blowing damn good, it gets it all right. Oh, it's a big, it's common, it's a big common. No, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, let's let it play out a bit more then. It still wants to go. Now I am nervous, why'd you tell me that? No, you're just doing fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, Alan at the other end, you can tell his story later. But he's got a couple in the net. Uh, I will also say the cameramen were only three metres away from his bed while he's having all this action. <laughs> yeah, another go. Right, it's the first time it's actually come up. Yes! Yeah. Ah. You sure it's a big girl? <laughs> big mate, yeah. Shows what you're up against on this lake with all this horrible dead slimy weed. That's why where a big tip ring comes in handy, but I have to say, this mono has impressed me. It must have sunk so far in the weed, it's more like lead core. Horrible stuff to get off. You'll be here all day filming this wind. I'm going to do something else in the meantime. Can I have a cup of tea please mate? <laughs> Oh, wow. There's one hell of a beautiful carp. There's, there you can see, perfectly hooked on a glow bug of all things. Mad. I woke up just as getting light and I nearly wound me glow bug in, but I thought, I don't know, low light. I'd won a few weeks ago on a glow bug just after dawn. Yeah, I think there may be something in it, you know, you, <clears throat> these are conditions you wouldn't expect, expect a zig to work, so we've got so much to learn still. Maybe it's the colours of, uh, you know, that bug, even though it's not dark, there's still something that hits the light right. Well, it certainly worked for this girl. She's a well-known 40, although she's been out this year under 40, so I suspect she's a bit under, but who cares? What a result.
chat or what? Yeah? What we got boys? 3888. Yeah, 3888. Yeah. On the watercraft angle, you know, as you know, I was over the other side yesterday. So I come down here and sure enough there was the odd fish showing. In particular, I saw one lump a couple of times over the far bank, about two thirds of the way out. And I had a black zig bug on it in the day, um, but nothing. Um, so last night we put the, the glow bug out um, and that's the rod that went off this morning. Okay, it wasn't dark, but that's the second fish I've had on the glow bug, you know, just after dawn and poor light, you know, you wouldn't expect it to be good zig weather. So just something to, you know, point out there could be something in it. But I'm just so loving the development. It's such a buzz when, you know, when you're working on development that it all comes right. The biggest fish in the lake and I've only been here 22 hours. Do I feel lucky? Sometimes you need a bit of luck. This is a, a ghosty. It's got some beautiful big scales down here and a lovely run of linear scales right at the top, across its top flank. And there it is. Mid to upper double. Ghosty. Another zig bug. Another one of the louse, so I really like this pattern. How near was that zig to the surface? Because yeah. the riser pellet's been drifting over it. Yeah, right under, mate. Literally right under. I've got three rods fanned out in sort of an arc, and that arc is is on the line of where you've been drifting the pellet for the last hour and a half. This is what I was talking about yesterday. Yeah, you can use a riser pellet to get them up. They won't maybe come up that last foot to take it, but they're right up in the zone just below. So fish as a zig, a foot below the surface, and can be really effective, as Anna's just proven. You can see it, I don't know, wing. can you see that? Well, this is my left-hand rod. Can you see the slick running straight down, not the center of the lake, but diagonally across the lake? That's the rise of pellet. Oh lad, by the way, I've got to go back to work. Us, us workers aren't full timers. We're lucky to get a day and a night in me and Adam. So just as he's caught this and the sun's coming out, after me being feeding for an hour with a riser and hopefully getting them up, I've got to go and work. But hey, am I feeling greedy? You've had a chunk, I've mate. had a chunk. Yeah, she's in amongst them, right? There it is. Another beautiful Club Lake mirror. And you can see there, I don't know if you can get in on that win. There it is. Little louse from mm. the naturals range. Definitely been my favorite pattern, you know, all the last year, but what with all the new bugs out, there's so much more variety to try and stuff. It really opens up so many options for zig fishing. I'm gonna get this unhooked. Another good hook hold. He's drifting the riser pellet over the lake and I just couldn't resist flicking a couple of zig bugs over the top. It really is an awesome method. Under the top, over the top of the riser. Right, that is it's just a touch under with the water going at 22 6. Brilliant, nice one. Well, we've come to the end of our short session. And well, yeah, we've had a bit of a result. Both of us have probably had our rods in the water for about 24 hours each, and, and Nash has obviously had the big one, and I've had five bites. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. But for now, I'm gonna get, get the rest of the gear packed up and uh, have a couple more laps with a bucket of floaters, just, just in case I can get a few taking off the top. See you soon.
I've got some exciting new bed chair innovations to show you, and I don't think any are exciting as much as the one I'm sitting on at the moment, the new indulgence tall boy. It's called the tall boy because of how tall it is. Look, I'm swinging my legs here and I can't touch the ground. Again, it's thanks to you guys and girls who've um, contacted us, you know, kindly given us your ideas and your thoughts. Uh, and one thing that constantly has come out is that you want a much higher bed chair, in the same way that we brought the uh, Daddy Long Legs chair out, I guess. So this actually is about the height of a Daddy Long Legs chair, and that's before you start extending it. And now you'll see the logic of why we brought out the Titan Brolly 2. So you've got the extra height if you want to use a big um, tall boy like this. We're only going to do it in sleep system form, we're not going to do it in bed chair form. To my mind, the future is sleep systems with the duvet attached to it. So, what's the Z-Bed about? Mainly, it hasn't got a hand wheel. That's the key, it's just got a hinge there, so it's perfectly flat, there's no uh, great lump of hand wheel sticking up and there's no great weighty thing. We've also looked at making this sleep system as keen as we can in price, well both of those Z beds actually, so it's an exercise in making a realistically priced bed. It's single thickness as opposed to the double thickness of the indulgent sleep systems. Uh, I would guess that's three, three and a half season. Um, for those who want to try one throughout the winter, I would suggest you recommend you get a shroud. How do you fold it up? Because we haven't got a hand wheel. That's the other reason for using hand wheels. So they hold it locked together. With well, this, it's simple. You've got a webbing strap. Pull that in, pull that down. Now look, I can't get that any tighter. You couldn't do that with a hand wheel because of the configuration of the teeth. So I think it's a much better way and a much more compact way of storing a bed chair. We've also got a bed chair version, which as I said, goes against everything I've just said, but we have to recognise a lot of anglers still prefer a bed chair. Immense value for money. You know, it's actually a bit longer you know, for tall guys, a lot of the Europeans, and it's wide boy width. I think a great new concept, worth considering. And finally, we wanted to make the sleep system principle available to all. So this is the H-Gun sleep system. Cracking little product, you know, entry level or starter carper. Um, amazing value. So now every car hanger can enjoy a sleep system. Last but not least, some uh, improvements and innovations to our frostbite sleeping bags to tell you about. Um, firstly, the outer material. This material has just become available. As soon as I felt it, I thought, oh, it's gorgeous. It's so soft, really light, and super waterproof. So that had to go on the frostbites. We've changed the filling. It's now got the, I think, world acclaimed holofill, you know, one of the best uh, materials for insulation. Those are in both sub zero and sub 20. We've got the sub 20 here. Um, that's the one for those of you who don't are new to Nash with the two layers. So in summer, a warmer we'll complete the uh, undo and take off this top layer. So you just sleep with the under layer. In winter or cold weather, you just zip it on. So it's a twin layer bag. Much easier than you know, liners that fit inside messing around with Velcro. In fact, I did that for 15 years and come up with this idea and could have kicked myself, it's so simple. But this also has another simple idea that I don't know why I haven't come up with before. I'll explain the thinking. Um, good sleeping bag design is about making the sleeping bag as close to your body as possible. In fact, some of the mounting ones have elastics to cling to your body. Then you're not trying to heat up air. You know, cavities, whereas anglers want loads of room, so that's why we have to have so much insulation to try and heat up all that airspace. I had this idea last winter and then went fishing all winter to test it, of putting these, if you like, curtains of insulation down the length and at the bottom, so when I'm in the bag they lay down the sides of me 
and you see the distance between the curtain and the edge of the bag. So all that area multiplied by two is air that I now haven't got to warm up. You'd be amazed how quickly these warm up and they maximise the insulation of the bag. Little silly thing, but a great idea. The Frostbite Sub-Zero uh, has not got the curtains, by the way. So the difference between the Frostbite Sub-Zero and the Sub-20s is a single layer of a four-season bag, and it hasn't got the curtains. But it's got all the other features I've just spoke about. So a cup of tea this morning, been up since before dawn, I'm watching the sun rise, it's magical. I'm on a water anomalously known as a pit, and I love it, proper pioneer carp fishing. It's wild, it's raw, and it's untapped, it's my sort of fishing, what I've done all my life really. I'm never happier than being on a water like this. This one's really interesting, 2.9 miles round, it's a big water. First heard about it about a year ago. Actually, a shop told me one of the customers was fishing it. A little bit uh, unusual, and we don't quite or didn't quite know the setup here. Um, it's been sold, and the guy who's buying it, he's got a guy on here just looking after it, and that guy has let us on, which is very lucky. Anna and I moved on here about April. But as you all know, we've had a terrible spring. It just rained the whole time we was here. First session was five days, I think. We never even saw a carp the whole time. But, yeah, we learned a lot about the water. What we've been doing is, because we didn't know where to start, really, we've just been figuring out places, pitching up um, where we can get a good view of the lake. And then one of us has been you know, watching the swim while the other's been walking, looking for them on big waters, especially if it's low population of carp, the key word is location, location, location. You can't just pick a swim, hope they'll come along, you've just got to be moving all the time looking for them. You know, it really is mobile stuff. It's been interesting to know Alan's been taking less gear every time, stripping it out. I brought um, an old 
rod idea I had a few years out and you know, actually we developed it. The scope was to be the same. They really packed down to nothing, but most importantly, you can really travel light and unencumbered with them. Really, I've just got you know, a little metro barra, and that's only to put my bed chair on, you know, my umbrella, and a bit of bait. Otherwise, it's rucksack on the back and you know, rods on my shoulder. Just so easy to move. And we can walk for miles that way. I love it. Four sessions, never saw a thing. And I think it was the fifth session we saw our first car. And we probably put in a total of 20 odd days to get to that point. And it was really exciting just actually seeing one. And in the sixth session, I got my first one in common. I don't remember what his weight was now, it seems so long ago 12, 14 pounds. And after so, I was over the moon catching that fish. It's not about size, it's about you know, the achievement to actually catch one out of this godforsaken place and it was awesome. The bottom of this pit is just mind blowing. You might be in two inches of water, you might be in six, seven foot. It's up and down like a yo-yo. It's for me difficult to get my head round. You know, across here there's channels, bars, islands all over the place. You know, it's a question of trying to figure out the ones that can't be using to get for you can fish a drop-off. I think, wow, it's great, but you know, can the carp get to it? You might be fishing in a room with locked doors, as it were. You know, it's been a right headbang trying to plumb it and you know, get around it. And, you know, how we've been doing it, really, is a lot of short-range work. Because you know, often the deepest water is just um, a few metres out you know, along the reeds, and then it really shallows up. But you know, A lot of shortish range work. Um, wading the baits out actually, using prodding sticks, wading out along the bars, just dropping them on the spot. Or not, if you can do it, there's no more accurate way. I've never known the lake with so much natural food. There's constant hatches coming off it. And the water itself is saline. Feel it, you know, it feels soapy, it tastes really salty. You know, hence, the shrimp population here is amazing. You put a land in there and enlarge it, put some ground bait in it, and half an hour later, you know, like a kilo of shrimps. Just incredible, they're big enough to eat in a chow mein. I've fished waters like this over 40 years, and especially when they're very rich, especially when they've never really been fished much. After location, bait recognition is the issue. Quite a little way I go about it. Sweet corn, as far as I'm concerned, is the most instant carp bait that is going. I've used it all around the world. Um, and I don't know a bait which a carp will latch on without ever seeing it before. The key is to use the sweet corn to get them looking for recognising bait, but then bait is something which they eat at the same time. So I'm mixing up sweet corn with our monster crab and crayfish boilies that are especially uh, produced by Gary Bays. You know, they're floral orange, so they really will stand out. And I'm also using a lot of pellet. Um, that's primarily to attract the shrimp. They seem to love the pellet. So the thinking is, you know, if we attract the shrimp, which is a food source of the carp, then we attract the carp as well. Rig wise, well, you can fish a lake like this for a long time and not get a tape. So, when you do get a tape, you don't want to lose it because the tackle's not up to the job. Strong, reliable tackle is key. You don't need fancy rigs. You know, these fish have never been up before. Like I say, bars up and down like a yo yo. You need to get your lead jammed in one. And because of the bars, I'm using the diffusion camo leaders because of the abrasion resistance. Simple rigs as well, you know, strong hooks and just simple blowback rigs. And then we did another session and then got his first one. And then it all came right for us on the seventh session. We had seven takes. Didn't actually do so well on landing them. I hooked a big fish. And just ploughed through the reeds, 
and had it on for about a minute and lost it. And I hooked another one and that grounded me on a bar. I was trying to slack it off and I just couldn't move it, you know, it didn't swing off or anything. And the end of the hook minute parted. Then Alan got one, small common. I can't quite remember the series of events, but all I do remember is late afternoon. And he got a take and um, way down and hit it and I just, you know, just moved out to a big fish, I saw it boil off. Remember I cut a long story short, it was blown away when this fish came over the, the landing net. Stunning mirror, you can see, a really heavily plated. One of the most amazing fish I've ever seen in my life, yeah. And that really made it for us. And I think the next morning I'm at 20 pounds, something common. And that was the end of the session really. Magical, magical session. Finally we was cracking it, you know, beginning to understand the fish you know, and everything was coming together, the plan was working. Uh, so we come down the ape session, um, we were actually wading around the lake, taking out some snags and that. And uh, <laughs> the owner come round and asked us you know, what we was doing. We said, well, we've got permission to fish here by Mr X. He said, no, you haven't. You know, he hasn't got permission to fish here. So, kind of um, led along a bit and we got chucked off. Amazing, really. Just beginning to get to the bottom of this place and uh, was asked to leave, shall I say. Apologies, I suppose, for being on the lake and we wasn't uh, allowed to, but we believe we had permission. I suppose that's life and that's carp fishing. You now need a new plan. Kevin Nash has developed the most blockbusting concept in carp rod design for decades, scope. Scope rods are available in two lengths, a radical 9 foot version and the more traditional 10 foot, the preferred length of legendary carp angler Richard Walker. The scope features an innovative retractable butt section resulting in a pack down size of 44 inches for the 9 foot scope and 50 inches for the 10 foot version, allowing them to be stored in the boot of a car. Scope rods are easy to use in confined swims, they cast accurately and the through action makes plain fish a dream. Distance specialist Terry Edmonds has cast in excess of 170 yards with a 9 foot scope rod. To complement the rods, Kevin has also designed the awesome scope landing net, featuring a telescopic lockable pole that extends from 44 inches to a very useful 6 foot 10 inches. The scope concept is the most compact kit ever designed for carp fishing the ultimate in mobility for the active focus carp angler. Scope for the future.
Nash Tackle have been making luggage for over 30 years and we pride ourselves on innovation and quality. Last year we bought you the Barologics Cube and it's been exceptionally popular. It made obvious sense for us to look at this concept and this year we're bringing you the Barologics Cube Compact. The Cube Compact is exactly the same as the Barologics Cube. Well, I say exactly, there's one major difference and that's its size, it's obviously a lot smaller. Let's open it up and I'll show you inside. As I said, it's almost identical to the original with regards to the way it's laid out. You've got a large main compartment here, more than capable of taking tackle boxes, etc. I've got my two rod buzz bar pouch in there, tackle box, PVA, marker floats, etc. There's another longer, smaller compartment. I've got my stiff rig box, uni rig bin. On the left hand side, if I unzip this one, I've got all my bait. This is actually an insulated compartment here. So I've got a couple of bags of freezer bait in there, pop-ups, catapults, dips, etc. Uh, moving over to this one. This is where I personally keep all my little bits. So I've got a compass and head torches and binoculars and Polaroids. And underneath all that, I've got my waterproof trousers. Flipping over to the other side, if I unzip this, I've got all my stove bits. I've got some gas, kettle, everything I need to make a brew. And finally, we've got another insulated compartment where I've got my milk and, and some cold drinks for the day. So as you can see, it is a lot smaller, but it's still enough space there to fit the vast majority of anglers' gear inside. If I zip these both back up, the product can be completely detached. So that means the shoulder strap can come off. If you undo these buckles here on the side, there's a zip that again breaks this section off. I can actually clip this shoulder strap onto here leaving the rest of the bag in my swim and I can actually go for a wander, you know, go off, do some fishing, a uh, real versatile bag. Uh, as mentioned, they do break apart into sections and this just makes storing them so easy in the bivvy. Um, if I just quickly do this other side, flip it over, buckles, one zip, there you have it. This bit slides lovely underneath the middle section of my bed chair and then if I want I can put one at one end and one down the other end. It really is a great bit of kit, it allows you to be so organised, it fits well on the barrow and to be honest due to this sort of size you could actually just carry it on your shoulder and go off to the swim. Check it out guys, it's the Barrelogic Tube Compact. This is the big boy, and it's certainly big. I'm gonna quickly run through the sort of main features of it and what I've got inside. First up, on the top here, we've got two clips and web ins. If I undo these, it allows me perfect place to store things like waterproof jackets, trousers. If I open this main zip to expose the, the, the main carcass of the bag that I'd put up around 100 liters, maybe 110, you've got a drawstring and toggle. And the first thing I'm gonna get out is the bucket which just goes to show you just how much room's inside here. Inside the bucket itself, it's also worth pointing out these little BoxLogic D pouches. Really, really handy little pouches that fit neatly inside a bucket. I've got two in there and I keep all my pop-ups, sprays, dips, etc. Underneath that, I've got my actual bait for the session. Further down inside the bag, I've got a ZT all-in-one here, just to wrap up on those cold evenings or if I'm up early in the morning watching the water. I've got my stove bag with my Coleman's inside. And then further down into the bottom, I've got a sleeping bag. On the outside of the bag itself, we've got lots and lots of different compartments. You've got a lot, nice long compartment here that I use to keep my bank sticks in. Sadly, it's empty at the moment because uh, although I am working, I have managed to flip my rods out. So usually I'd keep my sort of bank sticks, uh, bite alarms, etc., down in here. On this side, I've got all the tea kit bits. So I've got my, my fuel, uh, cup, kettle, etc. Uh, and down the front of the bag here, I've got my tackle. So you can easily fit one of our medium boxes in there and you can also fit a larger one if you wish. So as you can see, plenty of back support there. Uh, this will wick up any moisture. Um, we've got two decent shoulder straps uh, and we've also got a wrap round waistband uh, and all of this will help support it on your back, uh, making carrying it to and from the swim a lot easier. I'm gonna stick it on and then I'm gonna head off back down to my swim. So we'll get this slung on my shoulders and just set all the straps so it's nice and comfortable. Uh, first up, I'm gonna pull these main straps down and set it on my back so it's nice and tight. And we've actually got these lovely little moldings here to make it easy. So I've just put my thumbs in these and I'm just pulling it down. And I want that to sit, the base of that to sit just here. You know, it's nice and comfortable there. 
so it's lovely and tight next up I've got a chest strap just to pull those in and keep them really sort of taut around my chest again nice little buckle and clip that's that bit sorted and finally my waist area just to finally pull it all in nice and tight like so and that's me ready just mention these there's a couple of little pockets here again you might want to keep your phone in here or all the likes but that's me this is the big boy as you can see it is a big boy but once i got my rods and a bed chair under my arm i can go off into the distance fishing Hi, I'm Terry Edmonds and I'm here at Marsworth Reservoir to fish at range. Oh, I've got that on camera. Bit of a scrapper in close, considering it was caught 150 yards. <laughs> Oh, a little bit lively. Right, and here she is. Mid double, I suppose, maybe a little bit bigger. But there she is. Nice old common. Fishing out there about 150 yards. So like a reed line. The Marsworth fish are, are all like this. They're all dark old ones, like the canal fish that run near to it. Lovely time for a bit more bait, I think. For this session, I've been using this new Entity Spod Rod. And I'm fishing the reeds over there about 140, 150 yards. And it's like making that real easy work. It's a really nice action spod rod. It's got 50 mil ring in, which I love for all my distance work. Like the handle length is really important on spod rods. I've got average size arms. And what I like to have it is, is the handle outstretched like that. That's really important for the leverage when you're casting. If it's too short, it's hard to use. The action of the rod is like an all through action so it can be used short or long, no problem at all. Let me show you the rig that I'm using. Right, the first thing that I've got is the Missing Link Silt in 25 pounds. And I just take a little bit of this off the spool, about 10 inches, I suppose. So like, I'm gonna tie it a little loop in the end. And then what I'm gonna do after that is just put a little knot in the hair around there. This stops the snowman from slipping backwards and forwards on the cast. These are the new snowman pots that we're going to produce. This is the purple monster squid. And they've got a bottom bait in the bottom, which I'm going to put on first. Just 
put that on the hair like that And then we've got a small like pop-up in this other little packet here that makes the snowman rig. Just pierce that through the middle. Put it on like that. Right, now we're going to put this hair stop just right in the end of the loop, just there. And that just makes our little snowman here like that. I'm not gonna strip back any of this coating at all um, because I want the whole rig to be stiff. Like the hooks that I'm using are the Fan X size eight. And now we're just gonna put it through the back of the eye and set it for the length of hair you want. We're gonna go around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and that takes you to about level with the point of the hook. Then I'm gonna wrap back up three times. Then I get a bit of the Klingon putty and just put it halfway down the hook link. Only a little bit, just to make sure it sinks. And that is like the rig there. What I attach these rigs to are either these helicopter, like the Fusion Camo Leaders helicopter style. I can just tie that rig straight onto this swivel. I'm gonna just pull this tight. Now the leads that I'm using for over there are the four ounce long ranges. I like to fish my rods really, really tight. So a heavy lead's needed. So I hook on a four ounce and that's it. Like we're all ready to go. I also use lead core ones as well. And that's one that I've cut off one of my rods. It's exactly the same as you, as you can see, except that I'm using a lead core. And that's how I always fish at range. Right, I'm just about to put my rig out to the reed line that I'm fishing over there, over there about 150 yards. But there's a couple of safety aspects that I'd like to just go through quickly. Um, I'm using a shot leader, 50 pound this is, braid. That's very, very important. What I've got is um, four turns on the spool, straight up the rod, down to the butt eye. That's the length of the shot leader. And something else I would say, like before you cast these distances, every single time, just make sure that's done up tight, the clutch is done up tight because if that starts to slip during the cast, you're going to hurt your finger. Right, what I'm going to do now is just run through a cast. I know you've seen it before like on other DVDs and stuff, but I'll just like remind you of the basics. Like before you cast, you want to get your arms up high. Your arms up high. Remember that you're using the rod as a lever. So you're pulling down with the left hand if you're right-handed. Line yourself up, everything nice and steady, and then you cast. That's it, 150 yards on the reed line. Right, the rods that I'm using today like I have been for the last year, are the 13 foot three and a half NRs. Really, really happy with them. They are fishing rods, they're not overly stiff and, and they can be used from long range to short range. They're just top quality blanks.
Well, it's got to be a 20. Give it a thumbs up. <laughs> An inch back, that weren't coming out in a hurry. The fang X's, helicopter rig, like I was explaining earlier. It's one of the old mirrors in here, they don't, like they don't come out often, so I've been told. So, really happy with this one, and I'm going to give this one away. Twenty-five dead. It's looking like. Just so you can see it, I'm shaky a bit. Oh, that'll do. Right, really happy with that one. One of the old mirrors out of here. Um, like I don't get caught often, so I might put this down to my long-range fishing. <laughs> like they think they're safe out there, but I'm after them. So, let's have a look at it. There it is. Really happy with this one, to be honest. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna turn it round. There she goes, and I'm well happy. A lot of you guys and girls come on me Facebook with a you know, large number of different questions. Um, one that keeps on coming up all the time is about main lines. The big question here so much is braid or mono. So let's start with that, braid. Of course we do the famous bullet braid. In tackle box sales it's the biggest seller and we never advertise it. I think it's the biggest selling braid because it's so heavy and that is a massive advantage of it. You, know, you don't need back leads or anything. In fact when you lift it up in, in silty water you feel it pluck out the bottom so a massive advantage of a bullet braid is you know, your line is not off the bottom it's completely um, hidden the other uh, reason people like braid is because there's no stretch so when for example you're casting out and pulling back to a feature you can feel everything represent you through the tip ring so it's great for finding your spot and of course bite indication is so positive because there's no stretch the downside of braid is the fact it's got no stretch, so it can be really scary playing fish. You feel every lunge through the rod, but personally, I won't use it now if I ever believe um, I've got to hold on to a carp. I've had a few uh, uh, mishaps in the past where trying to stop carp going around islands and that, and you know, uh, my hook links uh, being destroyed. So it would be my first choice if I was in open water and never had to um, you know, clamp down, then I'd use braid all the time, but unfortunately most of my fishing there is times when I've got to hook and hold them. So for that reason I go on to monos for most of my fishing. Now we do three monos. I start with the decan. It's the mono I use and the reason I use it is because it's very strong, very reliable. Number one a thing for me is abrasion resistance. It, it is to me the big one. You know, most waters now have weed in them. You know, weed is by its own definition abrasive. You know, they get all the snails and everything and grit in it. You know, um, it can really damage a line. You know, and that's about other, other things like snags and all that. So I want a line, if it touches a snag, it's not gonna just part you know, because it's got no abrasion resistance. 
other advantages over decam over other lines is exactly what it is it's got you know the nxt decam it's got a um, unique camouflage you know that just basically disappears on the bottom not strength diameter it's probably you know it's up there with the best also very heavy as a, for a mono as well you know, so again it's getting towards a braid but for me number one is abrasion resistance then we do two others we brought this new line uh, in the spring called zig flow primarily designed for floater fishing or zig fishing your first question i'll be asked is why did i use the nxt decam for that the reason is because we designed the decam to be really heavy to, you know to make the line as heavy as we could so complete opposite with a zig line or a floater line of course you want it as light as possible as buoyant as possible to float up to the surface with a zig bugger on the surface so that is the reason we got zig flow so if you want a line for flow at work you know, i'd recommend the zig flow then we have soon to be launched hardcore it's a belt and braces uh, mono basically but we recognize um, you know, a number of people they just haven't got the money to buy a high premium mono so we've brought out a good a good basic mono you know that is great value for the money that's all i can say Apparently someone has been or some companies have recommended that when you spool up, soak your spool in water firstly for 24 hours. But yeah, by soaking the spool of course you're expanding the mono and so yeah, spools can blow up on you so I'd never recommend it. I'll go through the process of spooling up for all you. Firstly I'll use a bucket of water. Stick your finger through the label, that stops the spool tipping up. I never believe in putting the spool on the ground and having the line come off the lip because it might be going off the complete opposite way that it was wound on and that's one cause of line twist where it's logical if you're pulling the line off the spool you know the spool spun to load it so it must go on the right way so you put the spool in there now on your reel you'll note I've sellotaped the line to the reel I haven't knotted it that's because I once had a bad accident in France. I'd rowed a bait out and was going back to shore and I saw what I thought was a carp bow waving out, but it was actually my rod. It had spooled me in the time I was out in the lake and uh, my rod was being pulled across the lake and it was a right to and vote to get it back. Why spooling water? Well, as I said, that you, know, you keep the spool upright. By the way, if you have the water too deep, the spool might tip over. So you know, I only have a shallow amount of water, but that means the line is being lubricated as you wind it on. If your fingers don't get burnt, you can put a bit of tension on it. So that's why I do it. So simple as that. You know, wind it on, keep an eye on the line low. It's all going on great. And look how you know, so it's not burning my fingers. The spool's spinning away nicely. So I know it's all going on the right way. And it's tipped over, if it does tip over, just stop, yeah, because I was going too fast. Yeah, it's important you keep that spool going that way when you don't get line twist. And that's about it. So there you go, perfectly filled spool. And like I say, you know, I can cast that all day long, you know, play a dozen carp and that now won't drop down on the lip because I put it under with a bit of tension because I had the line wet and no line twist that line's not at all twisted limp and beautiful okay all you need to know about line I hope it's been helpful Hi, I'm Alfie Russell. I got down my local park late this morning, Hampstead Heath. I've just bagged the stunning koi and I'm going to slip her back and we're going to hopefully show you around and catch a fish or two.
This is the mixed swimming pond. There is a few carp in here, not many. I really fancy my chances on the number two pond today, and I've already seen some fish. So I think I'm gonna get round there, and see if I can catch some. Number two pond now. I'm gonna trick some bait in under this snag. I know the carp love it here. And I'm gonna place some rigs under there, see if we can nick a bite or two. Put my rig in a solid bag now. Inside it, it's got loads of crushed pellet and lots of squid. I'm gonna flick it out and see if I can catch a carp. Because it's close in fishing today, I'm freelining. And just to help my line float that little bit better, I'm just rubbing a bit of Vaseline on it. Nice Looks like he's stuck in some weed. A lot of weed, but there's a carp in there. <laughs> it's been a hard day fishing today, but finally I've nicked this little mirror. I think I'm going to get him back and then head off home. Perfect.
let's talk brollies and bivvies or more specifically titans and starting with this year's top selling titan the titan brolly all season i've got it up today to tell you about one addition we've made we put vents in the back as you can see uh, vents either side of the centre panel which means we can seal it properly uh, from weather conditions gives a lot of air through the back and that's done because of customer demand why are they so fantastic the Titan Brodies? lightweight aluminium frame super strong and the lightweight cover and you unzip the waterproof front you can put just a mozzie front or you can take them both off and just fish it open. It's so versatile, it's incredible. To save confusion from the old Titan Brolly all season and its new version, we're going to call this the Pro with the vents in the back. So if it's a Titan Brolly all season, that's the old model without the vents. If it's got the vents in the back, it's the Titan Brolly all season Pro. One of the questions I'm most asked is how big is a Titan Brolly all season? Can I get a wide boy bed chair in it? So a few words on that. This is a wide boy in here. Yes, it's tight, but it goes in. I put it at an angle, so I've got all the space at one side. There's ample space there for your rucksack, cooking gear, telly, whatever. A little bit of space there for a bag, and you've probably got about a foot across the back. Or if you've got a standard width indulgence, you can put it in square. But you see, there's plenty of room. It's compact, but it's very livable. Okay, but now I've got two bigger tights to show you that are new. So this is a tight and body one man. Quite a lot bigger than the um, tight and body all season, and I suspect this will be uh, the most popular. It's a good roomy one man, what I would call a one and a half man. Um, Equivalent, if you like, in size for those that know the models, a groundhog or the one man Titan. Again, preempting the questions, I'm going to get asked how big is it? Can I get a wide boy in it? Well, this has got our new Z bed wide boy in it, which is as wide as any bed chair, but it's a bit longer. So, yeah, that's a, a harsh test, if you like. And there's still plenty of room in there, so massive area in this corner because I've set it up the same angle as the, the Titan boy all season, so you can get a comparison. Other than that, the only difference between the Titan body all season is size. You know, two fronts, waterproof, mosquito, vents in the back, everything else is the same. Right, now on to the Titan body 2. Here's the big boy, the Titan body 2 man. I don't know where everyone's noticed, scaled against me, how tall it is. Again, you know, listening to our customers, there's been an interest in the old uh, Titan high top. People say, oh, why don't you bring that back? So a lot of people are looking for higher bivvies. Certainly something of this to do with you know, people suffering from bad backs. So it'll take two bed chairs. Um, be honest, two wide boys will be very tight. That's two standard width bed chairs in there. But as you can see, it's got plenty of space. And just like the other two, enjoys all the uh, features and spec. The new family of Titan bodies, I think there's something there that'll suit everybody. New family of Titan bodies excites me, but also this extra piece of innovation we've added to the hogs and groundhogs is a winner too, I believe. Basically, it's a space save frame. You know, normally, with an umbrella, you'd have the hub somewhere down here. So it's restricting your space, if you like. It's taking up a lot of space, but this has been pushed back, cut back as far as possible, and it's virtually as if it isn't there now. We've also uh, added this pole that would come with each hog and groundhog. You just screw it into there, press the button and it easily comes down. And when you set it up, you just slide that up. When it's locked, you can unscrew it. It just makes the setting up and the breakdown a lot easier. So that's a great new idea on the hogs and groundhogs.
following on from the amazing success of the Monster Squid Boilie, never one to rest on his laurels, Gary Bays at Nash Bait set about concocting a special high version of this proven bait. It was codenamed Purple Patch. We had huge success testing the new bait in the UK last year. This year we sent it out to our European consultants and the results were incredible. In Austria, big carp hunter Christoph Eckhart showed that big Austrian carp were partial to the purple monster squid and bagged a superb chunky common carp of 26.4 kilos from a large working gravel pit. Austrian team leader Arno Bergler took the purple monster squid on a short fishing trip to Croatia and showed what great carp fishing the Slavic countries have to offer, bagging himself this pristine 19.5 kilogram common. Purple pets did it again. 19 kilo 50, a great common and this gravel pit. Perfect day, perfect night. The fish was taken on a snowman setup comprising of a 20mm purple monster squid bait topped with a 10mm monster squid pop-up and fished in 14 metres of water. Yes! Ew. Great! In Italy, the purple monster squid soon proved to be a winner, banking some enormous commons. The two Robertos got amongst the better fish Roberto Bussolari banking this distinctive 20.5 kilo common. And the consistent Roberto Di Lorenzo appears again on this year's DVD after capturing this Italian giant of 26 kilos from a central Italian lake. Over in the Benelux, the purple monster squid proved to be an instant success. Willem Verspoor had a bite within minutes of casting out on a Dutch canal to land this incredible plated mirror of 38 pound plus yep. and another fish during his short session. <laughs> Zo, dit ogenblik zijn we de Purple Patch aan het testen. De nieuwe bodem van Nes. Geniaal. Aan. He had baited the night before, and as you can see, the fish had certainly been eating the bait. Over the border, Belgian ace Mark Pansar also got in on the action, banking this very special mirror from a tricky Belgian venue. German team member Daniel Karnapatsky took the purple monster squid on his travels, starting off banking this cracker from the mighty Rhone. He then headed over the border to France, where within just five minutes of casting out, his purple hook bait was the downfall of a mirror of 17 kilos, followed shortly by another one of 20.5 kilos. He finished off 2012 in style by catching this beautiful cold water German carp using 10mm purple monster squid, made even more special by the snowy conditions. And now over to France, where Jean-Pierre Becker used the purple squid to great effect. He started off in great style in the spring, banking this lovely fish at 23 plus kilos, before moving on to a massive 550 hectare venue for the summer. 
He caught himself some lovely fish up to 20 kilos from this challenging lake using the Purple Monster Squid Snowman rigs. And finally, staying in France, in November 2012, some of the guys from Nash HQ, including Kevin, visited Le Teliats for a well-earned week away. Despite freezing weather, the purple monster squid proved its worth and there were plenty of fish caught to a top weight of 67 pounds. Even the boss got in on the action. Three years ago, we lifted the bar, and if you like, pushed our luck, we bring out the carp cravers, because we didn't know whether anglers would accept them or get it, but the fact is you all have, and I think it's fair to say that now the carp crater is recognised as the number one way of keeping carp, simply because the carp are suspended off the ground. So, a great forward-thinking product. A couple of niggles I've had, if you like. One was the hassle in setting it up and breaking it down and the other was you know the real bulky thing and how it uh, sits on your barrow it's been doing my head but finally um, I think I've cracked it so we have a new range if you like of carp cradles plus this one that we're calling the elevator same principle but hasn't got the features of the carp cradles it's really done on price with the view you know make one as cheap as possible and then hopefully everyone will get on you know carp cradles what's different the difference is it's got foldable legs now. You don't have to pack, uh, set them all up. But the main thing is just do that, fold it up, and you can carry it around. Is that easy or what? And another point is, of course, your barrel uses. It's dead flat, so it's easy to store on your barrel. Puck away. Now I'll take you through the new carp cradles. In essence, the features are the same uh, as the existing. You've got the telescopic legs, you've got a pocket here, which could be on this side, depending which way you turn it around for your medicarp. It's got a nearly mat, again, that can be either side. And by the way, the nearly mat comes off, so you can put it in your cradle so it's not flapping around when you carry it. It's still got the flaps to you know, cover up, to keep the fish in the dark if you need to, sort your life out. And there's three different sizes. This is the standard carp cradle, same size as the last one. Then we've got the monster carp cradle. And we brought in, you know, what, what in all intents and purposes may look huge, well it is huge, uh, but it's actually been measured to fit a Teliat's carp. Big John has been wanting to buy the carp cradles, but they're just not big enough for his huge 80 pound commons. Got one. I'm not saying a lot because I'm nervous. A because from the few times I've ever fished me on Lake the Church, so I want to get this one out, and B because I think it's a good fish. And C, no, don't do that. Because I'm obviously concerned with the condition of it after the tragedy of the deaths up here. Go. Hmm? What? Did you say what he's going? 
heavily scaled, yeah. Well done, Alan. Well done, you. <laughs> Very lively, very look at that dorsal right up. I want to get her back quick, yeah. She's in good nick, but yeah, they've gone through a lot recently. She's a bit pale, I think that's because the weeds died and the water's covered, but all in all, no leeches, so she's not been laying up. Um, I think I can feel confident. She fought like hell as well, so. She's made a good recovery. And I trust the rest of the church fish have as well. Right, I'm gonna get her back. I'm not gonna weigh her. I don't need to know that much. Well, she's far away from me. New era of the church, eh? Jackie's thoughts on rig selection. There's three key areas I look at, and from that I'll figure out the rig I want to use. Firstly, I look at all the other anglers on the lake. Um, generally, they follow each other if you, you know, observe them. Um, you know, one's catching on X rig, other people see him catching on that rig, and they follow to you know, have the same success as him, and it goes on. You know, and so they all end up more or less on the same type of rig, or with very little variation. Another factor is that once an angler finds a rig that he has success on, they don't experiment much. So I'll be looking around the lake and seeing what kind of rigs people are using and then going the opposite direction. We're fishing for carp, and they're learning from the anglers who are fishing for them. So you want to go the opposite way to an area where they haven't learnt basically. Now our next uh, factor is strength in the rig and lack of complication. So my rigs I try and keep it as simple as possible, you know, law being the more complicated it is, the more to go wrong, the more to tangle. And on the strength element, well, I want to land them, you know, so I don't want any that are you know, too delicate, you know, so they might break, you know, let me down at the important point. So strength to me is key. And what I'm kind of saying there is I would sacrifice finesse of a rig to make sure I land the carp, because you know, there's no point in, for example, going down to ridiculous breaking strain, low breaking strain, and not be able to land them. You know, it's worth it's worth hooking four and landing them all, than hooking ten and landing none. If you see what I mean. My current rigs and there's two different ones I'm using are really focusing around the hook link. So that's where I'm making the difference and the changes. In recent years, we're more than a few years now. There's been a big swing towards plastic coated hook links. I've never actually got on the bandwagon, those who read me articles, I've regularly said I uh, use armour braid. You know, it's a um, very strong abrasion resistant braid and you know, supple, so that was where I was going a different way and getting the edge. In the last couple of years we've been developing a new version of it called armour link. I love the stuff, it's really smooth and so easy to work with it's so heavy as well. That's what we wanted to do to, to achieve the heaviest hook link on the market. Um, and I think we've done that with the armor link. So I'll show you my current rig that I tie in with this. Firstly, I've got this loop on the end instead of a link clip or a swivel. And I'll just do a loop to a swivel, job done. I do like snowman setups. I like it where the carp can easily suck it up into its mouth, but I don't want it wafting around around its mouth and head. So if you like, I'm making a super weighted hook link with a little dabs of cling on. I take a great deal of pride in uh, tying a nice neat rig, I suppose it's the engineering me, and it pleases me when they look really neat. And these little kickers I use help that. That's one of our products called a hook link sleeve slim. I just cut them in half. And look how neat that fits over the eye. And then we come to a hook, which is the twister, only hook in the world to use, in my opinion. 
Um, another little difference I make here, this is um, my blowback rig, slides back as you can see. Now the tube I use nowadays is 0.75 um, anti-tangle tube, a plastic tube and it's a lovely fit and um, you know, it lasts for ages, it outlasts the rig. I'll talk about blowback rigs while I'm here. The key of my blowback rig is that when the car blows, the pivot point goes back and it can never return. If it can return, then it's very easy for the car to suck on the bait and the hook point to be dislodged and come out. If the boilie is blown back and can't return, then when the carp sucks, the whole hook is tipped up, you know, so the hook pivots and it can't get a straight line to pull the point of the hook out. That's the essence of the blowback rig. It's a simple rig and it still works. You know, I've used it 20 years now and I'm still catching loads of carp, so I know it's still very efficient. So until I see it failing to work, then I don't see any point in changing. Every time I tie a rig, I do my palm test. All I do is just drag the hook across my palm. I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for as soon as I straighten up that hook link for that hook to turn and dig in. If it doesn't do it or it rides forward, then I'll mess around with the rig till I get it right. It might be just where the point that anchor tube is. And the other thing I'm looking for it to do is that as soon as it digs into my hand, that hook is sharp enough to hold there. You, know, you instinctively know that as soon as the, the hook turns and you feel it catch, it's, that's where you stop pulling. Then you hold your hand up like that and the hook should be hanging off. If it falls off, then I'll take out my diamond lap, just give it the subtlest of polishes and that brings it back up to super sharp again. My other current rig at the moment I'm going to show you. It's actually a rig that I first showed, I think, six years ago. Triglink is a major rig edge, uh, and it's a major rig edge uh, for one reason, that everyone hasn't piled into it. So, what's Triglink about, for those who don't know? Basically, it's a hook link that has PVA woven into it, as well as elastic. If you've got elastic in your rig, it's so difficult to tie it accurately into length. The PVA locks, locks the hook link so it doesn't stretch, so you can accurately tie the hook link to the rig you want, the length you want, and as soon as you immerse it in water, PVA melts, and now you've got a stretchy hook link. The stretchiness in the hook link, where well, it does so many things, you may notice you suddenly start getting a lot of twitchy takes, you know, you know bobbins bouncing up and down rather than, you know, um, just screamers. And that's because they've been hooked up, you know, this, this is a fish, by the way, it doesn't normally scream off, you know, the one you never even knew was on your rig, but he takes in the bait, gets pricked, he's caught up, he thinks, oh, I know how to get off now, but he can't, because he's in effect hanging from a bit of nicker elastic. And the other advantage of it, it, um, is a great boom in stopping hooks being pulled out um, when you're floater fishing or especially in deep weed. Um, I'm not going to go into that, it's a complex subject, but trust me, if you're fishing really weedy lakes and getting a lot of hook pulls, try a tree link hook link. But mainly for me, it's to use on the uh, ultra rig wary carp walkers, massive edge. So, how do I tie it? I have a length of trig link, what's that, about eight inches, a little bit longer than you know, my normal rigs standard length that is before I start messing around and but I think you need a little bit more trigger link so you've got enough stretch in it okay and then I combi it uh, to a bit of the armor link on the front it's just a personal thing I just want that finer bit of the end you know plenty of movement got my little edge of my kicker the twister and the snowman rig the trigger link is a bit bright and a bit thick we can't deal with the thick side that's because it's got the PVA and the elastic in it but if you get a bit of clay, rub that down it, then you can really you know, dull it down to the bottom. You know, if it's a silty bottom, you know, mix some clay up with a black silt and it just disappears. So there you go, the two rigs I'm on at the moment and I'm happy with them and I'm catching loads of carp. Saw a couple of fish moving out of this bay. So moved round and run into a rather ploddy church lake carp. Make 
3312. Big smile for me. Now please stay calm for a minute, darling, and go back. That's it. Come on, girl. Well, what a beautiful fish. This is Basil from Church Lake in Essex. And at 30 pounds, eight ounces, I'm seriously made up. I had two or three beeps on my sirens and I ran straight over there. Now, with a lot of indicator systems on the market, you'd ignore that sort of small number of beeps, probably wind or undertow or a bit of weed on the line. But with the sirens, when I get a beep, I know it's because something's genuinely happening out there. I'm gonna get this slip back and just have a quick chat to you about the sirens. What a beautiful fish. The sirens have been out for the last couple of years now. I've been lucky enough to use them for about the last four years. So I've been there since right from the early days of the testing and development. Don't get me wrong, we've had our teething problems along the way. You have those with all products, but they really are an exceptional product. We've had lots of letters of praise and, and a vast number of guys sort of writing in or phoning in to say that they've made such a difference to their angling. Why? It's down to the sensitivity system that we use inside. Now with a lot of other bite alarms on the market, if the conditions start deteriorating, wind, rain, undertow, etc., and you're getting false indications, you have to desensitise your alarm. By that I mean more lines got to be pulled before you actually get a beep. Now in the instance of a fish picking up the rig, sucking and blowing on the spot, there is a chance that it can get rid of the lead without you even knowing you've had a beep on other indicator systems on the market because you've had to desensitise them so much. Not with the sirens. I can always fish at maximum sensitivity. That means whenever that lead moves or as soon as the fish picks up the rig, I know about it. And I don't have to listen to all those annoying beeps in between my takes. If you haven't looked at them already, check out the sirens, guys. They really are a puck of bit of kit. Well, I've got a nice fish on here. It's a really beautiful carp. <laughs> I don't want to come up now, does it?
38 ball. What a fish, 38.4, such an, such an impressive carp. I certainly can't claim that the reason I caught this is because I'm so organised, but I can be sure it's helped. I'm going to get this one slipped back and as I said, I'm going to go and sit by the bivvy and run you through some of my favourite bits in the box logic range. Storing our tackle and other bits are something that as anglers we've all got to deal with and the box logic system really really helps with that. It's a large range that caters really for any angling sort of requirements. I'm going to kick off with the TT rig station. It's our blockbuster product within the box logics range. It's a large dedicated tackle box with legs that can double up as a bivy table. There's bolt-ons that can go on the side, a needle box and a critical balancing tank so you can test your rigs close to the swim. Internally, you've got so many various compartments to store all your bits. And at the front of the box, there's obviously a drawer that can be pulled out to store your rigs. The next sort of box size-wise down from that is a tackle station. Similar in design, but a little bit smaller. You've got two drawers underneath that you can whip out, again, to store bits inside. You've got a large area within the tackle box itself that's broken up into various compartments that you can configure to your own design. And there's also the ability to use it as a bivy table in that it has got legs that fold out. And the final large box within the box logics range is a bivy box table. It's been specifically designed around the medium tackle box. Again, it doubles up as a bivy table. The tackle box can be stored inside it. And there's also a drawer to the right hand side to keep other sort of accessories and bits and bobs in. That's the larger boxes required. But as well as that, we do two standard boxes, one medium box, one large box. Bog standard tackle boxes, but built to a high quality and they will last. There's also various smaller boxes and accessories that can fit inside any of those larger tackle boxes that I've just described. We also do a couple of bivy tables. The first one, the bivy table, it is just that. It's a great little table to fit inside your bivy, but it's a little bit more than that. Just like the TT rig station, you can also build bits onto the side of this, one being the critical balancing tank and the other a needle box. On the front of the bivy table, there's also rig retaining loops where you can keep ready tied rigs in, in a nice, easy, accessible place for when you want to change your rig, maybe after catching a fish. As well as the sort of bog standard size bivy table, we've also got the bank table. You could get a TV on it, you could eat off it. I do a lot of sort of general fishing in it and it's great for putting numerous bait boxes on it and the like. With all that said, uh, I really should talk about what I like to use and I like the Softbox XL and I'm gonna show you just why now. So this is it, the Softbox XL. We also do a smaller version, just a standard Softbox, but for the amount of bits I take, I've had to use this larger one. If we open up this first compartment, you can see I've got everything nicely organized inside. I've got my PVA, I've got my needle box with all my needles inside, hair stops, etc. Lots and lots of other baiting tools in here, hook sharpeners, scissors, forceps, levermans. Uh, on this side here, I've got all my hooks. They fit nice and neatly in there. Uh, some PVA, some PVA tape, etc. And then over here I've got various small com compartment boxes, some slim, some shallow. Uh, and here I've got the chod box, which I'm sure you've probably seen before. A uh, great little box for, for keeping your chods all nicely, uh, neatly curved inside. Uh, some of the other smaller boxes, uh, they've got various compartments and it's, it's really about you configuring it to how you want. This is a free compartment slim, for example. I've got all my shrink tubing, my silicon tubing, etc. in that. Um, here we've got one with all beads in it. This is a, a shallow six. 
Uh, another slim one here, this is a slim eight. I've got all my swivels and my metalware, etc. inside. And it goes on, it just allows you to be so organized uh, and efficient really, you know, whether that's efficient in getting another rig back out on the spot because the fish are feeding or efficient in just knowing where everything is when you want to tie a rig. If I flip over to the other side and unzip this compartment, first off we've got a rig board. Again, I can keep any rigs uh, I wish to uh, neatly and, and stretched out on this. Uh, and further here we've got a number of wallets. Now I use these as sort of a dumping ground when I'm changing a rig, maybe after a session or for the start of a new session. And I dump all my sort of old and unused rigs in here. And then when I get a spare moment, I'll sort of strip them down and get the components off them uh, of which I can use for future fishing. And then in the final compartment, I've got a medium tackle box. If we open this up, I'll flip this around so you can see. Uh, I've got various hook links, etc. in there, rig tubing uh, and all those sorts of bits. Uh, that can be folded up and then I've just got some lead core and stuff uh, filtered down the side. So as you can see, one Softbox XL and I've got absolutely every item of, of terminal tackle I need uh, with inside it. Not little pouches for this and that. Well I say that actually, there is one more pouch I want to show you and that's my dedicated leads pouch. This is the lead box Deluxe and I tend to keep all my leads inside it just so they're not rattling about and smashing things up inside with the rest of my terminal tackle. If I flip it open, you've got a compartment up the top here, I'll keep all my back leads inside and then some smaller pouches that allows you to separate your leads up. So for example, in one I'll have inlines, in another I'll have long rangers or flat pairs. And again, it allows me to be organized. I don't have to rummage through a load of leads to find the one I'm after. I can just take out one pouch and grab the lead I need. And just finally guys, there's one more product I've got to point out to you, and that's the Uni Rig Bin. It's a dedicated product, specifically designed for zig rigs, but you can store any supple hook link rigs on it. It just allows you to wrap any length of zig rig around it, put it under a bit of tension and then pin it in place. Uh, great for zig rigs, great for long float hook links. Uh, sometimes I even wrap the odd wire trace around it in case I'm fishing the water where there might be the chance of a big pike. So all in all, a very versatile product indeed. As I said at the start of this piece with that beautiful carp, being organised is important in your angling and for sure if you can get yourself organised and understand and know where everything is, it'll help you put a few extra fish on the bank. Looking back, it's been a great year. Hard work, but you know, really enjoyed it. Enjoyed uh, working, fishing with Alan especially. It started in the winter, fished a club lake right through deepest, darkest nights of winter. There's two reasons for that. We wanted to have the final testing on the purple monster squid. Get 
get back. We'll be after some more purple patch. The other reason fishing through the coldest months was I wanted to test technology like those um, curtains I you know, showed you earlier on the sleeping bag. You know, all those thoughts to test and the only way to do it is to go out there and do it and test them properly. So I learned a lot from the winter's fishing. You got a car? I think mine's bigger than yours. I hope it isn't as they're your rods. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, mine. <laughs> yep. Well done, Alan. Look at this beautiful linear. Nice little stuff here. As far as I'm concerned, any carp in winter is a good one. <laughs> Old winter's carp. One side. Tilt his tail up. <laughs> Got water on your face. I'm getting shot out here. <laughs> awesome winter brace, yeah. Right? Two beauties. With water running down my nose. <laughs> 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 But I was looking forward to spring and I was so happy when the sun came out, well for a little while anyway. Um, and the zig bug um, testing and fishing was very interesting. Proof of the pudding, you know, that um, big common, you know, in less than you know, 22 hours, 20 hours fishing. Then I was on to my big pit, my kind of fishing. Um, uncaught fish, unknown, where to start. It was really challenging and I absolutely loved it. Um, came to a kind of a bright end, but I'm pleased to say um, misunderstandings have been sorted and we're back on there. Been such a busy summer, finishing off my book. I so enjoyed writing the book. Um, taught me a lot about myself, to be honest. Tackle-wise, what's the big moments for me? Big items of tackle, the blockbusters. I think, again, Nash have pulled it out of the bag in terms of innovation. Biggest has got to be the scope and the dwarf rods. I really think you know, scope rods are the future, or any rod where you can you know, minimise the packet length. The Z beds, start of things to come, I think, you know, with doing away with hand wheels. Two new Titan brollies, the one and two, especially I like the two because of the height, I think that appealed to a lot of anglers. And talking of height, the new tall boy bed chair. Also, I've got to mention the Cyber Shop throwing stick. The idea come from a dear old friend of mine, Kerry Barringer. He's uh, been on the scene for years, savvy member, really knows his stuff. Uh, so thanks for Kerry for giving us that one. It's a wicked stick. I can tell you nothing can go as far and so accurately that it won't kill your arm. Got a tape. I was just about to go home. <laughs> Done enough of this filming. I'll go and get a take. What a lovely way to end. First session on the church for two years. What a great way to end this year's DVD. We've just been looking at this fish actually. We don't recognise her. She's a bit lively too. She's got a bit of a damaged dorsal, an old wound, and you say none of us know this fish, so that'd be great if it's a new fish from the church. I'm happy with that. We slip her back, but before I do, it's like to say. Thanks everyone for watching this and thanks for being customers of Nash and supporting us. See you all next year.